Next, in the continuation of our fisheries management stuff, um, we want to talk about um, one of the most popular new tools to, uh, to, to, to better manage our, our fishery resources. I want to talk about uh, the notion of protected areas, specifically marine protected areas, what we typically refer to as MPAs, and talk about those initially with some concepts, and then we'll go through some examples around the world, and then we'll, we'll end up with what we've been doing here in the state of California. First thing to make sure we're all on, on board with is this notion is, is one of the challenges with a lot of our um, aquatic, well, th this is a problem for various species across the planet, but in particular, it's a challenge for our marine critters. And this is this notion of they're often possessing so-called bipartite life history traits, so two-parted life history traits. The, this would be describing so-called open populations as opposed to a closed population. A closed population would be something like a deer, a, a, a population of deer in a valley. There, if we want to know how many, how many baby deer we're like, or how many deer we're likely to have next year, we count the number of deer right now and the number of pregnant mom deer, right? And then that's going to be a decent estimate of how many deer we're going to have in the valley next year. In contrast, open populations, much more difficult to predict. So we'll take the example here. In this case, this is a rockfish. This is Boccaccio, um, one of our, our local species. And while you and I are most uh, familiar with seeing the adult fish, seeing, seeing the adult phase, where that fish is swimming around, let's say, the kelp reef, the rocky reef. Uh, but when, the, when those guys go to have their... Um, babies, and so that, that sedentary phase, that adult phase, that conspicuous phase is the thing that you and I tend to think about. But they also, when they go to have their babies, they either release their eggs or they release their fertilized eggs that are evolving, these little embryo guys starting to get bigger and bigger. Those guys are being acted upon by the currents and they're being dispersed by um, all these other factors that are not under the control of the fish per se. And so we have this sedentary phase to the life, this relatively dispersive phase to the life of the critter, and that leads to, the, again, this two-part life cycle. And so therefore, the input to a particular reef, the input to this reef, isn't simply the amount of pregnant moms on that reef, right? Because most of that, well, it depends on the species, but, but oftentimes the reproductive output from our focal area is exported to somewhere else. So it makes it much more challenging than, than the traditional deer in a valley type of, type of question. Another key thing to, to note about a lot of our means, uh, marine species, in particular our fish, is that the reproductive output, the number of new individuals potentially entering our, entering our population is not linearly related to the size. So here in this case, here we have a vermilion rockfish and a uh, uh, standard length on the side, or no, maybe this is total length, I guess it's total length on the top, from the, the tip of the lips, the tip of the nose, to the end of the tail. And we have the number of uh, babies that could be produced in a, in a given year from um, a 14.6 inch fish, et cetera, to bigger, bigger. And what you see is it's not linearly related. So this guy on the right, or this lady on the right, has 17 times more out, potential reproductive output than the individual on the left. So, yeah? So, so the question is maybe at, at some point they, they become decrepit, at some point they lose the ability to, to reproduce. Generally speaking, uh, no. Um, I mean, if they're so wounded, I mean, maybe they're going to die. No, no, pretty much. Mo so a lot of these fish have this great degree of what we call plasticity. And so um, they might not get this big if they don't have the, enough food resources or something. But if they have enough food resources to grow, pretty much they're going to be able to reproduce. So we don't see something like you see, for example, in elephants, where at some point, or other mammals, at some point, the 
the adults le lose the ability to reproduce, but they, the let's say the the those older adults might hang around and provide some some evolutionary advantage to the family. So maybe they they act as uh, they know where the water is during droughts, or they can help the mom, the new moms, that kind of stuff. We don't really see that with these types of critters, generally speaking. Okay, so first is this bipartite life history. So the, this two-parted life history, relatively open population dynamics. And the second is this notion of this non-linearity of, of fecundity of, of potential reproductive output. A marine protected area, a protected area, is basically one type of what we historically have called a biological reserve. The basic assumption with this management approach is that if we take this area of the, 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 this chunk of this ecosystem, if we take this area and it's, it's kicking butt, it's doing all the things you want, it's, it's, it has all these organisms and these energy material flows, et cetera, if we have that, and we, and we set it aside, that's the best way to keep, or many people have argued that's the best way to keep our communities, our populations, our species viable and robust, right? So this is, this is essentially the analogy of taking, uh, of turning into a museum, right? So, so kind of throwing this in a, uh, a canning jar and putting it on the shelf and just keeping it all nice and pristine. Realize this is an incredibly, incredibly American view of nature and resource management. This really comes from our traditions, our philosophies, our inheritance of wilderness. And the notion is wilderness is the best. And wilderness is an area without people. So this notion of a, a traditional biological reserve, people are not in the picture. Okay, so why might we need these? This should be fairly obvious, but here's a, here's a couple quotes for you guys. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read those to you. The first is, during my recent visit to Santa Catalina Island, I was deeply impressed with the threat and danger to the commercial and valued sport-giving fisheries at, at the island, and then some other stuff, and then continues on. This island, uh, for three or four miles offshore, is the spawning ground of the valuable food fishes of Southern California, and particularly of Los Angeles and that this region should be protected absolutely from all kinds of nets or line, lines handled for commercial or market purposes. So that's one quote. The second quote is, fishing uh, around Catalina Island over the previous 30 years uh, decreased stocks to the extent that, and some other stuff, the supply has dropped off to a menacing extent due to lack of laws, lack of protection, and overfishing, some other stuff. The angler, uh, the angling here in a year I've left blank to a year I've left blank was the most remarkable in the world. But with the coming of power boats, seines, trawls, and other nets, the fisheries began to decrease until it was evident that something must be done. The most menacing danger was the alien who attached a gill net to the kelp and ran it out to sea. Fifty such nets have been counted in a mile and a half. Okay, so those are, those are uh, quotes from a couple different reports about, about uh, the... the fish stock condition and fisheries management off of Catalina, one of our channel islands. Um, what's your guys' guess as to these two blank years that I've, that I've left off here? The angling here between blank to blank was the most remarkable in the world. What do you think, what would you guess those years would be? Wait, wait, I'm gonna write these down. Okay, 1960, 60 to 70, what, what are the other guesses you guys have? 90 to 2,000, what else? 70 to 80. I'm sorry, 1880? Okay, good, we got 1882. 30 or 30 to 1910. Somebody else? 1930 to 1950, okay. Any other guesses? Okay, so here's the answer. So 1886 to 1900. That first report was written in 1912. The second one the year later in 1913. Oh, right? <laughs> That's crazy. That's over 100 years ago. People, I mean, there's obviously there's clues. This was older about alien and, you know, weird kind of hyphenated words and stuff that we don't necessarily hyphenate now. But, but right, with the exception of 
maybe some possibly racist words and stuff, right? This is really, you, we could have written this today, I would argue, right? This, this doesn't seem that far off from some of our initial discussions about, about our, our marine resources. Would you agree? No, nobody agrees. No, it's totally different now. Great. Excellent. Everybody's what, catatonic for the midterm or something? That's what's happening? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so as a result from, from these, these uh, reports and, and agitation, the people were worried that we were essentially overfishing. We were harming our fish, fishery resources. So the state of California then decided to put a three nautical mile, what we would consider a, a, a marine reserve, around Catalina Island, which banned all nets, and, and that was the idea, hey, we're going to save the fisheries. That lasted less than a year thanks to political pressure. So the commercial fishermen, mostly out of San Pedro, um, and, the, and the associated canning, uh, 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 fish canning operations in, in the port of Los Angeles, San Pedro, that area, um, basically lobbied and said, hey, this is messed up. And so the, so the state of California said, okay, sorry, we'll just not have that anymore. Again, we might be familiar with the same stuff today. So for example, um, here, here are some of the things that these guys were seeing. This is from this old study. I lifted several of these photos. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, so there, there's what we used to call black sea bass. Now we call giant sea bass on the left, right? Again, one of our top, if not our top carnivore on our Southern California reefs, this is now an endangered species. I've only ever seen one of these diving one time it was a juvenile and i about messed my pants because it, it came out of the kelp and it, it looked like a vw bug i mean it was it, look it was a small guy but it was just so amazing and these guys look at the mouth on that thing huge gape and they suck up whatever they suck up lobsters suck up other fish voracious predators so major structuring force on our near shore subtidal ecosystems here in southern california uh then we have a white sea bass up on on uh up on top up there from the same era. And then we have uh, an image that I took uh, off of one, um, one of the pages near where, where uh, I got some of those quotes about the, you know, so many fish, so many uh, nets. And what you see here, this is a, a Catalina and this is uh, these guys getting essentially bait fish so they can in turn go bait hooks and get other fish. But just in this picture right here, let's take a look. We got uh, one over there. We got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Here's a boat here, thirteen. Thirteen of these boats, and these guys are all putting out nets to get fish. So a ver just just from the visual image here, relatively high fishing effort in this um, one small uh, off this one small beach off of Catalina. So that's what, that's what triggered people's concern. And maybe we should try a protected area. This, well, this is 2016. This should be 2017. Um, but let's talk about marine protected areas. So again, rarely do people say marine protected areas. Oftentimes, they just use the acronym MPA. Uh, I think the most important quote, uh, at least before the current generation well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll just say the most important quote anyway. Uh, marine protected areas have been driven more by opportunity than design, scenery rather than science. Even as we talk about, we've tried to introduce a lot of science and be much more objective and much more effective about designing these things, there still is a strong legacy of opportunity. It's been getting better, but um, we've inherited a lot of stuff from the past that we can't necessarily get rid of. We have. We have you know, thousands of reserves in, in more than 80 countries now. I've listed for you guys the largest uh, global reserves. There's the, the Phoenix Island protected area, the PIPA on, on Kiribati, South Pacific Island. And we'll, we'll talk about those in the future. There, there's, there's another part of the story. But for now, at least on paper, we'll just say it that way, on paper, uh, more than uh, 41,000 square kilometers. There's um, the protected area around the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So we have the Hawaiian Islands extend for thousands of miles. You and I are used to thinking about the so-called main islands 
Oahu, Kauai, Big Island, that kind of stuff. But but it's a continuous stretch that goes up across the Pacific. And these in this reserve system we're talking about here is primarily in the northwestern areas. This was first declared by President George W. Bush, and then at the very end of President Obama's term, he expanded it uh, a bit further. So this is now a huge, uh, covers a huge amount of two-dimensional area uh, on the surface of the ocean. We have uh, the great, the, one of the most famous ones, the Great Barrier, <clears throat> Great Barrier Reef, which you guys might have seen some of those readings or postings about the incredibly quick decline, um, maybe as much as a third of, the, of that amazing biogenic structure, the only biogenic structure you can see from space, um, is, uh, is in rapid decline, massive coral bleaching, et cetera. But, but suffice it to say, it's, it's a large uh, system. And then we have the uh, Pacific Remote Islands National Marine, uh, National Marine Monument that includes various locations at about uh, 224,000 square kilometers. How does this compare to California? We'll talk about California more uh, later. I don't know if we'll quite get to it today, but, um, but just so you have some sense, looking at this, Elkhorn Slough in the middle of Monterey Bay, um, which normally on our trip we go and see. We, we, won't, we won't now again because of uh, PCH being closed. But uh, Elkhorn Slough, two square kilometers. Carmel Bay, four square kilometers. Wrigley, which is this one out of Catalina, which is one of the oldest uh, really effective reserves. That's where I did my PhD. And when I was an undergrad, like you guys, where I, where I worked, um, 0 0.15 square kilometers. So most of our reserves that you might be familiar with, that you might go to, much, much smaller than these grand, vast, massive swaths of the ocean that you might, uh, people popularly talk about. Uh, globally, the median size is something on the order of about four, I haven't updated this data in the last couple of years, but so it's probably not exactly accurate now, but it's basically about four square kilometers with the average size because of the, the outsize effect of some of these massively large reserves. If you, look at the, if you look at the mean, it's 44 square kilometers. So probably the best term that I think most characterizes this issue would be the median uh, statistic. And so the median size is about four square kilometers. Does that make sense? Questions? All right, let's talk about a little a theory as to how we might enact a reserve or how we, you know, where might we, we do stuff. And in particular, things that we've uh, learned from the marine realm. The first is that marine protected areas uh, can work. I'm not saying they always will work, but they can work. Different metrics on the x-axis. One is the biomass, the total, total amount of material, of, of fish, of invertebrates, etc. Density, the number of individuals per square meter. Uh, size is the, the body length, and that could, be, that could be standard length or other measures depending on the critter. And then diversity, the number of different categories, most typically expressed as species, but it doesn't have to be, of of critters. Now, this is a combination of a bunch of different studies. This is from 124 different uh, marine protected areas around the world. So uh, it's not always, so, so, yeah, okay, fair enough. So whatever that study measured, and for those of you that are doing capstones, this is a great type of an approach of a so-called meta-analysis that you could do something like this for your capstone. Uh, but the idea here is, okay, so we, we had a condition, we enacted the protected area, what happened? And so this is the amount of change before versus after, at some period of time after we've enacted the marine protected area. And what do you see? What's the pattern you guys see? There's more. There's more stuff. There's more stuff. On average, there's more stuff. The black dots are the actual raw data from each of the studies. And then the green bar represents the average value of all those guys. So if you look, you will see there are some black dots below the zero, suggesting that the, those studies saw a reduction in whatever that, what that, that condition was. So marine protected areas are not perfect. They don't work every single time all, all the way. And have a look. Some of these guys, if we look at biomass, some of those values are almost 3,000% increase. Others are more like 
I don't know, 25, 30, 40. So there's a huge range in response. You guys with me on that? So, so a marine protected area is not a guarantee that something that, that if we do X, Y will definitely happen. Uh, what else? What, what other, what other uh, takeaways might you guys have from this? Oh, I, I should just also note by way of, since we're working on our, our analytical quantitative skills, just so you guys know, there's a note, there's a break between the 500 and the 1,000 uh, 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 units on the graph. And so, and so it's a different scale above versus below. So just to be clear, it's not a, it's, you guys with me on that? So that's just to, to squeeze it all on one graph so you guys can better see it. That is maybe okay to do, maybe not okay to do, but realize that's what the um, folks that generated this graph did. Is that cool? Okay. What, so what, what's the, okay. So one, we saw that generally things are positive. What, what else? They're just increasing in population. Right. It depends on the metric. Right? Is everybody hearing what I was saying? It, it, it depends on the metric. So biomass seemed to respond really well. On average, almost 450% improvement. Whereas when we talk about something else, density still improved but it's only more like 170%. Then we start talking about overall body size, nah, it's more like a 30%, you guys with me? Yeah. So some metrics are perhaps more sensitive to uh, and, and, and or respond quicker to the establishment of marine protected areas. Others, take, others either don't respond or maybe take a lot longer to respond. Cool? So when you're having a discussion with someone that might be skeptical of this thing and you're an advocate of it, you probably are going to pick the biomass uh, argument, right? Oh my God, it's like 400%. And then that other person is going to say, whoa, you mean, are you talking about a mere 20% increase? Like, no, no, I'm talking about 400%. So, so again, both things can be true. And so we need to be really clear when we're talking about what we expect to come from the establishment of this of this management uh, technique, the the protected area, and and uh, and be and not over promise. This field has been ripe with over promising, uh, ripe. It's been rife, I should say, it's been rife with over promising um, stuff that maybe doesn't instantly materialize, and then people say, "See, see, see, told you it wouldn't work." Be, let's be very careful with that. Okay, uh, we can all, uh, okay. Then we can talk about um, other examples. Of things, this is uh, from uh, my one of my old TAs uh, when I was an undergrad. Um, but this is looking at a marine reserve off of uh, Anacapa that has been there for quite some time, and so we have some some uh, longer term data. And you can see here on the on the upper right hand graph, this data goes from 1982 to the early 2000s. And they essentially compared what was going on inside the marine protected area and then just outside the marine protected area. So having a look just at that graph on the right, um, uh, what do you guys, and, and so the, the, um, the blue line, or sorry, no, never mind, never mind. So, so, so this is, this is uh, the condition of the reef. And, and to remind you guys really quick, uh, Healthy, abundant kelp, lots of stuff, lots of critters, lots of biomass. When the kelp goes away, less biomass, less diversity, less uh, resources. Right, right. So one of the things, uh, we, one of the potential values of a marine protected area is as a buffer. So it maybe doesn't stop, uh, you know, climate change, doesn't stop ocean acidification, whatever, but it gives us, gives us a bit more freeboard to take some of those stressors. Maybe it's a hurricane. We have a bit more diversity that can bounce back after the, the, that disturbance. Good. And so, right, and so what we think's going on here, we, what <coughs> has been surmised is in the marine reserve, we're not sucking out the lobster. So the lobster are more abundant. The lobster help control the kelp, the potentially kelp-eating sea urchins, right? And preventing them from becoming a so-called urchin barren where, which, which is what happens when they starve and they just all come out as a big front and they just mow everything down and kill everything. Versus in the fished area, we tend to suck out, we tend to capture a lot of lobsters because they're tasty and we like to eat them. And, and that therefore there's relatively speaking more urchins 
And so in particular years where, where the kelp is stressed, those urchins can become an urchin barren and nuke the, nuke the kelp. Yeah. Okay. Here are the things uh, we should be focusing on if, if you guys want to design a marine protected area network. Location, where is the actual uh, boundary going to go? Size, how big is it? And then assuming we're making a network here, note I didn't say a marine protected area, I said a marine protected area network. So by definition, there's more than one. Uh, so then the question becomes, how close to that first one should the second one be? What about the third? What about the fourth, etc.? And then uh, the last uh, key uh, component is what Rainey was asking before about that enforcement, right? So, so how are we going to make sure that these boundaries are real, that these, that these limitations are real? And, and the criteria we might use to decide where the, I mean, and this, these are just to, you know, starter ones, but, but suggestions. But if, when we're trying to initially suss out some sites for location, we might think of areas that are, have the most representation. So if, if we have an estuary and sand flats and kelp reefs in, in our area of concern, areas that maybe have all of those or, or, or include those, maybe that's a, those are key suggestions so that we, we capture some of the different habitat for all these potential different critters. Two, in terms of size, one of the key criterion is how far can these, so here's a fish we want to make more of. How far does that fish, at least the adult, the relatively sedentary phase, how far does that individual move on, on average? What's a typical movement? Is that guy going to swim for 30 miles or is that guy going to swim for three meters? And then same exact idea, only in this case about the dispersive life history phase, spacing. So spacing would be if we have a bunch of moms on our reef and she lets loose her eggs, can they get to the next, the next island, if you will, the next marine protected area? And then again, enforcement, the, 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 the two key things there are one very clear, it works best when it's very clear, it's very obvious. So typically our boundaries go from say a promontory or a pier, something that, that it's, there's, everybody can pretty much understand simply, those, that's the best. And then secondly, do we have any political slash financial commitment to truly provide that continued enforcement? And I should say, as, as we're going on here, just to be, just to be um, clear, uh, uh, marine protected areas can take a whole variety of flavors. And I've noted it here on the bottom as a partial MPA and that would be one that says maybe you can't take lobster, but you can fish, uh, you know, uh, fish. <laughs> you can take fish. Or maybe you can take fish, but you can't take abalone, you know, something like that. So that would be a partial. And then, uh, and that would be versus uh, so-called no-take reserves where truly you can't take anything. Most of the theory, most of the examples I'll show you here, focus on the no-take reserves, because those, those are the most obvious, the, the clearest. It just says nobody take anything outside of, uh, nobody take anything inside the boundaries of this area. So typically, most folks will talk about no-take when they do the academic studies, et cetera. So here are some key questions, and we'll run through some examples of these. Is that, is that good? Any qu sorry, questions about that? Questions about those components? We'll go through some examples in a sec. So I'll ask you guys. So why did I say that um, most of the studies, et cetera, tend to tend to focus on no take versus partial? Steve. Harder to, harder to keep track. Basically, basically. So there's a guy out there with a fishing pole, and you go out there. What are you doing? You, we can't fish. Oh, I'm not fishing for the shark. I'm fishing for the cod. Oh, okay, right. It's just, it's just a lot, it, it's, it's insanely more complicated to manage if, if, if people um, could say they're doing A versus B, et cetera. 
Um, it's just a lot easier. If there's a guy out there and he's got a fishing pole, boom, no question, boom, you're, you're in violation. So it's actually easier for people, as much as people complain, it's actually easier for the fishermen and easier for the enforcement people if it's just, if there's no, to reduce the ambiguity. Can't do this here, you can do this there. Good, other questions? <coughs> Zoom tag. Okay, so let's look at a couple of questions uh, from, you know, in the current world of how do we design marine protected areas, et cetera. The first is this notion of percent protection targets. We'll talk about that. But that, that essentially says uh, how, many, how much of our coastline should be in a protected area? Well, we'll shoot for X percentage. And so the first question is, is that type of an approach with picking a percentage, is that effective or useful? Another key one is, again, how large should any one reserve be? Again, all this is to be effective. All these questions. Key one is, do marine protected areas increase fishery yield outside of the boundaries of the, of the particular unit that we're talking about? And then fourthly, if we have, as I meant that, that quote that I, I shared with you guys from 93, um, you know, uh, so we have this existing legacy. Can we use that existing legacy of existing areas of protection, of restrictions, of fishing, et cetera? Can we use those in future revisions, expansions, whatever, of a, of a candidate network site? So can we use, the, use our history to help us as we try to improve management in the future? So how, how, uh, how, how, how might we answer these questions? What do you guys think? Or, what what, what general it. approaches would you guys take? Data okay, go out and get some data. Great. Right, so, that, so that's good. So, so all those things you guys are talking about are all great ways to do about it. I would put all those within the empirical data category. The problem is, historically, we've, we're getting better. In the last couple of years, we're, last decade or so, we've gotten a lot better. But, but historically, um, we didn't have a lot of marine protected areas, slash, we didn't have a lot of marine protected areas monitored. So while all those things you guys were talking about are great. That's the gold standard. How many fish do we have now versus how many did we start with? That's great. Um, we can't always do that. And in particular, we can't always control, uh, we don't typically do um, uh, idealized experiments. Um, so the problem is we have few, st at least initially, we're getting more and more all the time. But, but as of the early, early two, 2000, the early aughts to mid aughts, we've had very poor uh, data in terms of that type of you know, strong, rigorous comparison. So because of that, we have historically, in the field of marine protected area design, relied heavily on models. And what's a model? A model is a simplification of reality. Every single model is wrong. Yep, it's true. The goal is to make a model that, um, that gets the characteristic of the natural world as, as closely approximated to reality as possible, right? And these models, even though they, they suck and all models suck and no models are perfect, they, they, it's another tool we can use in our quiver when we're asking, hey, what would happen if? So they allow us to ask what if questions. The models are only as good as two things. One, they're assumptions. And two, what, what initial data they're parameterized with. Again, that initial data historically was quite poor because we didn't have a lot of data to begin with. So that was a weakness of the models. And um, oftentimes, because people don't want to go in the wrong direction, these, these usually tend to be very conservative. Uh, they don't have to be, but in practice, they tend to be very conservative and sometimes overly conservative in terms of um, their predicted effects, okay? So we have empirical approaches, we have modeling approaches. Ideally, we use the empirical stuff, but we've, we, we frequently, historically, have had to almost rely almost entirely on modeling. As, as the years go by, we can, we can um, de-emphasize the models, or at least have the models parameterized with better, better data. And so, so things are getting better as we go forward in time. Every model can be manipulated. 
uh, it's up to responsible scientists to not manipulate them up the rigmarole. Some people in our society would have you think that scientists are just like every other interest group and they'll manipulate their models. Nobody I know that, that does this type of work manipulates their models in, in a disingenuous way, right? So, so generally speaking, people are not doing what, say, the tobacco industry does, what the oil lobby does. They're generally not doing that type of stuff. Uh, I'm not saying that that never happens, but, but I've, I've not seen that. And the way we guard against that is peer review. Right? The way we guard against that is we publish our data. We're transparent. We show everything up there. And if somebody did introduce bias into their model, somebody else will critique it and will, will self-correct. That's the value of science. And that's, that's, why we, that's why science is important to use as one of the key foundations for effective management. So let's talk about the first idea, which is this notion of protect, percent protection targets. Let me give you a little bit of history of this in the context of marine protected areas. The first thing we have is the IUCN. The IUCN is a it's kind of funky organization. It's, it's quasi-independent. It's quasi-tied to the UN. Uh, I serve on some panels for the IUCN in, in, in full disclosure. Um, but uh, basically, uh, these guys came out with a recommendation in the early 90s and said, hey, this is all ecosystems. This is not marine. This is just everywhere. Nations of the world, you guys should shoot to protect 10% of your whatever, mountains, 10% of your deserts, 10% of your forests, etc. And then um, and then we have some guys that are working in Florida. Sometimes good things do come from Florida. Uh, and so, the, so these guys are working for the state and they're, they're, um, we ha they're studying a, a really interesting, essentially natural experiment. And this was Cape Canaveral, where we launch our, the moon mission, where we launch our satellites, you know, all those kind of cool things. And because of, obviously, especially back in the day, when we're shooting astronauts up into space, the big Cold War space race, they didn't want people just randomly walking up to the rockets, right? One, it could kill them, but two, it's a security thing and there's something to mess with the rockets. So we created these security zones around the perimeter of Cape Canaveral and you couldn't go in there. So in effect, we created a marine protected area in the waters and estuaries around Cape Canaveral. And so these guys started to notice that, oh my gosh, fishermen, uh, like a lot of the records of the biggest fish for, for near shore fishing, they're happening just outside the boundaries of, of, of Cape Canaveral. So these guys started looking at it and they started saying, oh my gosh, this notion of, of a protected area is a great thing. Maybe we should think about this. So they started thinking about it and and so they were going to make a recommendation because there's th these guys are working for a state agency, so they want to know a recommendation, right? It's not academic research for the sake of research. And so once, once this started to be interesting, people said, hey, so let's make some guidelines. What should the guidelines be? And they said, oh, right? They, didn't have an, they, they knew that, that this one area was effective, but they didn't know, should we have all of, this, all of the state waters be, you know, what? And so, so they, they had this 10% this protection target and these guys basically, I had a beer with one of these guys one time after a meeting and I got the whole story. So he basically said, uh, you know, I don't know. 10% doesn't seem like enough. We should probably have it more than 10%. This, this didn't have any models yet to support any of this. So should we have 50%? 50% seems too much. 40%? Mm, 40% seems too much. So trying to, him and Han and trying to figure out what to do. And they said, and this is again, late 90s. And knowing full well that it takes a long time to get policies passed through legislatures and stuff like that. Uh, maybe we should give them like, you know, a couple, you know, 10, 15 years, something like that. So they're hitting around something. And so then they also realized that, uh, again, not trying to disparage any of our wonderful elected officials, but sometimes not all the elected officials really... Uh, shall we say, understand some of the science. So they're also trying to figure out how can we make a, a simple argument that, that everybody can get. And so they basically hit on 20% by 2020. So they thought, ah, let's try that. 20% of, in this case, the state waters in a form of, of no-take marine reserves by 2020. That's 20 years. That seems like a long time. It's like, you know, whatever. So the, and, and, then, and then the American Academy of Sciences endorsed that. So it's kind of crazy how that came. 
right? So it wasn't the traditional scientific route of doing very careful, careful uh, study and whatever. It was basically, I don't know, about a fifth. That sound right? Sure. Let's go with that. Um, a few years later, the World Parks Congress uh, got together and they suggested somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of waters should be uh, of, this, of jurisdictional waters or state waters or national waters should be in the form of a no-take reserve. And then the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, which was uh, first uh, drafted in 1992 in Rio, uh, that, um, that uh, when they have the, the ACHI uh, revision, uh, those targets say that we should have 10% of our marine and coastal areas um, uh, be in a form of no-take by 2020. So remember that. So we're getting close to 2020 when I show you the data later. So the goal is 10% of all of our, and I should say, I, I, I've hammered into you guys that the ocean is three-dimensional and all this and that. For the purposes of this, for the policymakers, it's two-dimensional. So for the purpose of this, we're talking about two, you know, X and Y, latitude and longitude, so, so surface area. And then everything from the surface down is, would be protected but that's not counted in the volume, right? We're just talking about surface area on the, the land use map, if you will. I should note that they, that they had a higher target for terrestrial and freshwater areas um, of 17%. You don't need to look at all this. Suffice it to say, these are just some examples of some of the, especially earlier modeling that was done. Um, look at the range, five to 50%, 15%, 20%, more than 30%, 40%. So, so there, there's a, a range of values. If we average those out, and I haven't done this for the last couple of years, but for the early data, um, that comes out to something like from the theoretical modeling studies, about 34% of the area of the two-dimensional area should be in a form of protection. I'm going to talk to you in a second more about this notion of conserving biodiversity versus increasing fisheries. But let's hold on that for one second. Let's finish this idea. Uh, in general, the notion of somewhere between 20 and a third, you know, one fifth and one th third, basically, um, is what a lot of these folks uh, feel. Um, and that uh, because because that 30 that 34 percent might be a little bit too much, might be a little too conservative. Um, the one thing that everybody finds with all these modeling studies is the more screwed up the resource, the larger area you need. So the more overfished, the more extensive the protected area slash the protected area network needs to be to recover that functioning. For all of North America, Canada, everywhere, we're talking less than 1% of our waters are in a no-take marine protected area. So North America with Canada, with the United States, these rigorous governments, wealthy countries, a, a small fraction of, that, of those territorial waters are protected. The next question I want to touch on real quick is, is how big should a marine reserve be? And here's where I want to introduce this important notion. Uh, why are we creating a marine protected area? There's two main flavors or excuse me, two main motivators that get people to enact a marine reserve. The first is biodiversity. We want to save all the coral. We want to save all the kelp. We want to save this ecosystem, right? This ecosystem is harmed because of an oil spill, because of a whatever, and we want to conserve this community. One. Two, we want to increase our fishery resources. We, we have a fish population that's been getting lower and lower and lower, we want it to be more and more and more abundant. Okay, and here's, and here's where, and so, so in many cases we just say, hey, we want a marine protected area, and you don't necessarily get into why, but here's an example of why, or of where that why really matters. So the question is, how big should a reserve be? And the answer is, it's going to depend on our objective. Are we seeking to maximize the amount of biodiversity that's an end result of this management effort? Or are we seeking to boost fishery production? So here's an example from where we'll, uh, uh, we're actually not gonna quite go this far on our trip uh, in a couple weeks, 
because the PCH is blocked just to the right of this. But, but historically, we go and see this, but you guys get the idea. So these are, these are two different, uh, for now, I haven't told, told you the definition of these. These are just two different types of protected area uh, along the, the central coast of California. For biodiversity, we want to make, on, as, as a sort of first level approximation, we want to make the reserves as big as possible because we want to see so-called entrainment. We want to see all the babies that we produce end up in our same spot. Cool? That's going to mean we have more coral babies, we have more kelp babies, we have more lobster babies, all these guys sort of staying within our boundary, right? And that's going to be, tend to be good for our overall biodiversity. If, in contrast, the goal was to make, uh, to boost our fishery yields, the opposite is going to tend to be true. We're going to tend to want to have smaller and smaller reserves so that we have this orange illustration uh, uh, happening, which is so-called spillover. So we got, our, we got our, let's say the moms and dads are protected, but their babies are going to leak out. And then we can catch those leaked out babies and we get more fish, right? We're able to harvest those fish. So there's, in the case of how big should a reserve be, there's a natural tension between the biodiversity advocates and the fishery advocates. So, um, so here's, here's how we might figure that out. So on the left, here are some different critters. Here are some different fish. And so, and the, the, this data comes from different regions, different areas, but just to illustrate the idea. So this dory on the top, if you look on the bottom, the bottom is from tagging studies where we've either put radio transmitters or we've put actual, actual uh, so-called pit tags, actual things. When you look at the fish, you can see there's a tag on, on it. And then either followed it around or or release them in the wild and then saw where people, where fishermen basically catch them. And so we can look at where they started and where they ended, for example. And so this is um, a maximum distance approach. And so this, this dory, if you look up here, right, this first bar here, right here, this guy, you know, is, is going, and this is in miles, this is going, you know, about a half mile. So those guys are staying relatively tight to wherever we first caught them. Um, this this uh, rabbit fish is a bit more than a mile. Then we have something like this snook, which is over a hundred miles, right? So you can imagine if our goal is to is to recover one of these species, it's really going to depend on on if we're working on the dory or we're working on the snook. That's one approach: adult uh, adult tagging data. Another approach comes from population genetics, where we can look at how similar these organisms are of, of, of one particular area, the individuals in one particular area are to the rest of the, say the reefs in the, along the California coast or whatever. And what you see is you get some estimate of how far these, in this case, these, these genes, the, the, the genotype has moved up and down the coast. And what you see in the case of many seaweeds, they, they tend to go not that far. They tend to go on the order of a mile, less than a mile. We talk about invertebrates. Invertebrates have by far the widest spectrum. Some of these invertebrates go a centimeter and plop right down. Others go potentially hundreds, if not greater, of miles away. Fish um, have a, a somewhat truncated movement. Most of those larvae go at least, at least on the order of hundreds of meters to a mile or so, and some go significantly farther. So we could so again, if we were designing this to make sure we conserve the invertebrates, we might have one answer. To design to conserve some seaweed, some some algal resources, we might, you know, do that, etc. Here, here are some reviews from about a decade or so ago that I think are still pretty uh, helpful at our level, at this sort of general level, which um, uh, Ben Halpern and his group from UCSB suggested that. Um, the effects could be independent of size and they recommended something on the order of 10 to 20 square kilometers um, for for local for for critters on on you know local kelp reefs kind of thing uh, the the group from davis the the next one the hastings and bots uh, bosford those guys suggested that 
Um, we should make it as large as practically possible, acknowledging the economic challenges with enforcement and other stuff, if the goal is conservation. But again, if fishery, OK, so, so this, this would be assuming we have 100 square kilometers to divvy up. Should we put it in one reserve that's 100 square kilometers, right? Or 10 that are in 10 square kilometers? That's sort of the idea they were looking at. And, and like we already just, like already, already mentioned, they argued that the conservation goal would say one big, huge reserve or maybe two large reserves. And then if the fishery goal is the motivation, you should have a lots of little teeny tiny ones. So, so what's the verdict? The Halpern study says independent of reserve size. So is, is that the general consensus? Are no, effects? no. So, so the answer is, so, so this is still, we're still figuring this out. Okay. So I, I'm just doing the mile high view with you guys. You guys are welcome to read these papers. But the idea with this is that each of these, ha each of these really has more specific, you know, more, uh, there's the motivation behind these things. So these guys are looking at California reefs or worldwide reefs. So there's always these sort of caveats with their, their explorations. I'm just giving you guys a sense of what the, the modeling results are telling us. Yeah? We'll talk about what our reserve network is in a bit. Um, we have a mix of reserve sizes on our reserve, but, we, but, but on average, our reserves here in California are, are much smaller than some areas of the world. So, so we've, we've gone more towards many small as opposed to one or two just gigantic ones. Cool. Uh, and then uh, Steve Gaines and his group, um, specifically looking at places like California, um, suggested that, uh, uh, again, if we have this strong dispersive force, this vector to, to move the babies around, so that they definitely can get from site A to B to C in that condition, like for example, California with a strong uh, littoral current. Um, we would want uh, multiple uh, reserves rather, you know, multiple small reserves rather than one big honking one. And, and that, that paper also suggested that um, well-designed marine protected area networks might do a better job than many of the other traditional fisheries management things, such as some of the ones you guys already talked about, uh, gear restrictions, size restrictions, that kind of stuff. Um, and then, OK, so I'll just show you guys this, and then we'll look at a, a couple other examples here. But so this is some data um, from about a decade ago, a literature review. And these are some of our local species here in California. And so these guys just basically went to the literature. Again, a perfect project. You guys could all do this. It would be a great capstone type of an approach. So they went, again, this would be a meta-analysis. And you're seeing a trend here, right? Overall theoretical review of this. Review, it's, there's not a lot of, uh, not a huge amount of raw data. Um, we're getting more and more every year, but, but we started with not very much, so hence these approaches. So in this case, these guys went and they looked at all the literature, and they said, hey, here's this species. How, how? How does this guy move, right? How far does this guy move, et cetera? And uh, what they found is most of these guys move less than three kilometers from their original tagging or original observation point. The blue fish are all shallow water species. The brown guys are the deeper dwelling, deeper reefs. And as you guys know, as we start to go down deeper and deeper, the, the communities tend to get a little more homogeneous, a little more homogeneous, less patchy as they are in the shallow waters. So that seems to make sense. So 85% of these 26 species uh, move less than three kilometers, and the, the deeper water guys were the ones that actually moved farther. One of the concerns with marine reserves and how big they should be are, are so-called highly mobile species, so things that swim really far. That's for a variety of reasons, but one of which is those things that swim, swim really far tend to be relatively high 
Atrophic levels, right, tend to be the, the more apex type predators. And we know from before that those are the guys that we historically humans have overexploited most. Those are the ones we hit first, those are the ones we most nuke. So we have some special uh, concerns or worries. Will these reserves work for these guys? And so, uh, right, so, so more connectivity. The, the if fish can go from one side to another, that, that should boost resiliency, we think, of this network. And so here's an example of low connectivity, right? So these guys mostly don't tr move, right? So the guys that are at the island, we'll do that again. The guys that are at the island stay at the island, generally speaking. The guys that are at land stay at, uh, at land. High connectivity would be something like this, where these guys that are on the mainland, they go to the islands, the islands go back and forth, etc. That That's the sort of scale that we're talking about in terms of highly mobile species. So let's look at some data from our friends at the Shark Lab. Uh, Chris Lowe's group at Cal State Long Beach, our, our, our colleagues down there. And so here's our, we, we've not talked about this yet, we'll talk about it in a second. You guys have, you guys have some readings about this, but we haven't talked about it in class. But this is um, the network around the Channel Islands National Marine, uh, the Channel Islands National Park and in Channel Islands uh, National Marine Sanctuary waters uh, around our five northernmost Channel Islands. So here we're looking at acoustic receivers. So these guys, one of the main things their grad students do, if you guys want to do this for grad school, you should apply to go to a master's program with Chris and those guys. But one of the main things they do is cut open, catch fish, cut them open, put a radio transmitter inside of them, sew them back up, let them go. And then we have these, these, this network of listening stations, some of which are on our, our pier at Santa Rosa. And, and they, they listen all the time. And so, so they're passive listening. They're waiting to hear a blip, 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 blip. And each of the little transmitters inside each of the fish has a unique identifier. So we, ah, oh, this is number 312. And then we go look in our database and that's this fish that we caught in this location. Does that make sense? So the yellow is all the listening spot. There's actually more than this now, but this is some older data. Um, right, and then again, the, the marine reserves are the areas in pink slash red here. So the first thing to say is one of the things that they focus on are, are sharks, large sharks. Uh, I should also say, if you guys are interested, we're, we're uh, partnering with these guys to do some of the juvenile shark monitoring uh, and we're adding that to our beach sustainability index. And so we're, we're gearing up. We, we did some pilot stuff this past summer. We're gearing up to start to use some of our aerial drones to monitor juvenile sharks in Ventura County and Malibu this summer. So if you guys are interested, um, you should let me know and take our intro to drones class in the spring. Anyway, um, so one of the things we, these guys have found is that uh, we're getting large sharks. We've known this, but they just confirmed this. Large sharks are coming from the blood triangle up, up north where we have uh, the Farallons, et cetera. We get these large sharks that move down into our channel islands. Um, and presumably those guys are coming in to eat and they're coming in to eat our, our pinniped populations, not the focus of this lecture, but important to say that the recovery of things like our sea lions and elephant seals, massive conservation success story, massive conservation success story. Um, and so now the populations of some things like elephant seals, uh, may well be greater or, or at least the size um, as when we began exploiting those guys in the 19th century. So, so really great success with some of our marine mammals. So these guys are coming down to eat them because they like to eat them. Um, but we also see, and so that's not surprising, white sharks, big, big sharks move all around. But the interesting thing is smaller bodied critters are also um, seeing a fair amount of movement. So let's look at uh, the array. So these are, let's talk about some of the bat rays, one of our ubiquitous shallow water um, critters. These are uh, elasmobranchs. These are cartilaginous fish. And um, they mostly munch stuff on the bottom. So they mostly munch things like uh, with the pump, uh, um, turban snails, crabs, stuff like that. No, they're usually dark colored. So there's a picture on the lower right right here. So they're usually, I mean, they can be, they can be sort of lightish color, but more typically they're darkish color. They'll, they'll, they'll semi-bury themselves in the sand. 
So they might look sandy colored, but, but their actual skin is, is usually um, darker color than the sand sediments. Okay, so here we go. So here's, here's bat rays. So uh, not many hits on those, although we do have some on our island, on Santa Rosa. White sharks, um, we get those guys much more ubiquitously uh, around the island. And we see evidence of these guys move in between sites. Generally speaking, as you guys have, have read from our recent uh, news articles and stuff like that, we have a lot of babies, juvenile guys, less than five feet uh, in total length, uh, white sharks in tight in our beaches, Ventura Beach, tons. Um, um, a lot of our uh, off Orman and stuff like that. And then we, what we have out of the island are mostly the adults, the, the big honking dudes. Uh, giant sea bass. These guys are uh, on a couple islands. Uh, bigger sharks uh, ubiquitously across the islands. We do have some evidence of these guys going from island to island. So again, these are evidence of these guys moving between. Uh, yellowtail, very popular uh, sport fish. So we have some evidence of these yellowtail guys hanging out, uh, staying relatively. Um, and so these guys are, you look at them, you think they're highly mobile, and they are quite mobile. But in this case, these guys appear to be staying relatively close to. Um, in, this case, in this case, San Miguel. What's that? Is that unusual for a cartoon? Well, so we're, we don't have, we're just, people have just really started using this tagging data in the last 15 okay. years or so, so we're still learning. But, but this guy at least was staying, uh, staying close to the island. And then, and then um, move between islands. Okay, so here's some, here's some guidelines. So here, here's some, taking all that stuff together and putting it, putting it together in some summary, uh, summary slide. Um, how big should the reserve be? It's gonna depend on various conditions. If we're talking about near shore, shallow water reef areas, for example, relatively small reefs, are probably going to be okay. I mean, relatively small reserves. I should say, should say, relatively small MPAs should generally be okay. Because things are so heterogeneous here, um, a relatively small reserve could still encompass a variety of things. Might have some soft bottom, might have some hard bottom, some rocky reef relief, etc. When we start to get deeper offshore, farther offshore. Um, we don't maybe need as many small, uh, uh, as many separate units as we do at the shallower sites, but the areas generally need to be bigger. A third category that we've only begun to explore, this is much more theoretical, nobody's done this yet, but people have started to talk about, okay, shallow water, that would be like our estuary or just off our beaches. Offshore waters would be, you know, deeper water. Gyre-based reserves would be mobile. So this would be a, a mass of water that spins off, right? A, a, a corkscrew gyre that's going to go. That might only persist for days or weeks, right? And so, so this is a dynamic approach to thinking of protection. Uh, it would vary over time and place is only possible with our modern technologies, N not possible 50 years ago or something like that. Uh, how you'd enforce this, whatever, is, is crazy, but, but people have started to think about a reserve at the scale of a gyre, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just leave that for you guys. So here's some research that I did during my PhD. This wasn't my main PhD, but this was, this was a accidental, unintended consequence. I ended up doing a little study about how fish react to things. This anybody? What, what fish is this? You guys know? Kelp bass, right? The most popular sport fish landed in in California. It, it, they're in Southern California, but because there's so many people, this is the most popular sport fished fish. Kelp bass, Paralay blacks, Clathratus. Uh, anywho, um, this is a typical size. You see them like right in front of us. So that's a couple fists fists long. That that sort of size. Very pretty fish. The fishermen will call this a calico bass, but we would call it a uh, kelp bass because we're scientists. Um, and so the question is, how? Uh, so do we get benefits outside? Amazing. These fish, I would go out to where the edge of the reserve was, not marked, just on a map. And inside the reserve, there'd be tons of fish. 
swim outside, just visually fewer fish. It's crazy. It's like, how do these fish know that they're in the, you know, there's no fence up there, but they do seem to know. Yeah. But this is a key, okay, so the, f the first question is, do we, if we put it in a protected area, do we see more fish, right? Do we see more fish? Hopefully, if not, what the hell are we doing, right? So here's some evidence that just says, yes, that can happen. So there's some, there's some uh, laminate, there's a kelp here, and there's some flapjack here. This is from down in our, our friends in New Zealand that did this. And what we see is, so we initiated the reserve, and sure enough, there's more, there's more, algal individuals after the versus before but have a look with this guy with this with this blue line kelp it's pretty much steady more and more every year a little more every year a little more every year a little more with this pink lined kelp it's yeah there's a little more but not very much a little teeny bit more a little teeny bit more a little teeny bit more and then something happens and boom then they explode and then they get more abundant right so so we there's different responses based on the ecology of these critters and the local conditions. Um, same kind of idea here. In this case, these are fish off of Kenyan, in Kenyan waters. Check it out. Uh, this guy, this parrotfish, really quickly got more abundant or, or, or got bigger. This is biomass, right? So big response and then pretty much stabilized. Whereas this surgeon fish, much slower expansion, but continuous expansion. So there's different response characteristics, but in general, we see most things, regardless of the response, the quality of the response, the right side of the graph is bigger than the left side of the graph. So marine protected areas do work for increasing fishery yield inside, or at least I should say they can work for increasing uh, yield inside the, the unit areas. The question is what happens outside? So this is Georgia's bank. We, we've been talking about this. Again, the big cod closures, right? The, the, obviously, Cape Cod is there in, the, in the, the greenish color, the land. The ocean is in light blue. And then in the edge of our exclusive economic zone, the edge of our territorial waters is over there on the, on the right. The marine protected areas, the closures, where you can't fish at all, are in that uh, light blue. Well, I was going to say, what is this? But I already labeled the graph, so sorry. But So this is transponder data. This is, uh, this is dangerous area. Anybody see the movie um, Perfect Storm? One, one, two, three, radio. Okay, Jesus, now everybody, so everybody saw it. You just want to raise your hand because you're drooling because you're too tired from the midterm, I see. So, so anyway, this is, so this is data and we see more and more of this. Another fantastic idea for Capstone. More and more data that we're not designed for a conservation purpose, but we can retool, repurpose that data to be useful in our management decisions. In this case, these guys might die because the, the oceans here really can be crazy. So one of the things most of these fishing vessels have on them are these transponder units. So they're getting their position and then periodically, once an hour, whatever, they're, they're reporting their position back to uh, automatically to some centralized repository. And that's, that's initially for safety for the fishermen. If the boat capsizes and we don't hear from them, we know they were last in location X, right? But by the way, it also tells us where they've been. And so that's what's being plotted here on this heat map. So the hotter the color, the more times a vessel was reported at that grid cell on the map, the cooler the colors, the less. And so what do you see? Where is, where's all the fishing happening? The edges. On the edges. This is so-called fishing the edge or fishing the line. So these guys are going right here, and they're, I'm gonna wait right here, right? And as those fish just barely get on the edge, boom, I got them, right? So this certainly implies that the fishermen think yeah. that these reserves uh, lead to augmented production outside, right? Because that's, that, that's where they're clearly doing the best in terms of their, their fishing success. Make sense? And specifically, this data is when they're going at a slow speed from one, 
from one time period to another would suggest that they're, they have fishing gear deployed. It doesn't guarantee it, but it suggests that. So, so this, it doesn't necessarily say that these guys are illegal fishing in here. They might just very slowly be moving through, and these guys might be having lunch right here. But on average, the slow, slow fishing is, is, um, is what's going on here. It's interesting how two of those protected areas don't have much fishing around them. That's right. Yeah, so some of them people are like, oh, this sucks. I'm not going to waste my time here. I'm not going to waste my time here. But actually this, you, you, in many cases, you can actually map out the reserve without any – you can delete this layer on the GIS, and you can still see the reserve, right? Because the, the intensity of the, of the fishing vessels being located is so tightly right on the line. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so we'll end with this, and then we'll pause it for today. So that to summarize that stuff – do MPAs yield uh, fisheries? Yield, uh, uh, do MPAs boost yield outside of the reserve? We know that they work. We know that they definitely work inside. The question that you guys should know about is this: this debate over attraction versus production. Attraction is so. This picture right here on the right. I didn't grow all those fish. I put up my my, um, I'd say my floaters, but that sounds kind of gross. I put, I put up my, my manipulation, and within a couple hours, these fish all showed up. I did not make a bunch of fish in an hour. These fish were in the environment, and then because of the, because of the conditions that I set up, they chose to self-locate in relation to that. So I didn't produce any of these fish. I attracted these fish here. So to say that I, that I grew more fish biomass, at least initially, that's, that's incorrect. You guys get me? So that's attraction versus production. What we'd like to see is we'd like to see production. That's babies. That's new stuff being added in. It can very easily be – attraction is very easily confused for production. Uh, so definitely increase inside. The amount of spillover is more vague. It definitely happens sometimes, but we, it doesn't necessarily always happen. Um, in general, these reserves reduce the variability in catch, though. Does that make sense? So the year-to-year -year landings, the, the difference in year-to-year -year landings tend to go down when we have a lot of marine reserves. So ultimately, that translates into more stability. So that, that's, that's, that's a... That's a that's evidence for spillover, but not, not proof. Second, um, generally speaking, if we have an over-harvested, a poorly managed fishery, and we add marine reserves, generally speaking, we see the yield go up. Again, suggesting that spillover is what's going on, but not hard proof that it always works every time. And then lastly, and, and here, here's the important one you guys should mull over. Maybe this would be on a quiz. Adding reserves to a well-managed fishery tends to reduce yield over time. Why might that be? Okay, I'll just tell you guys because we're out of time. So, okay, so the idea is second to last bullet. If we have a poorly managed fishery, there's almost no fish left, and we put up a marine reserve. Over time, we tend to get more fish in our nets because we're making more fish. If you and I have a really, an already kick-butt, well-managed fishery that is really abundant, and then we put marine reserves in, the yield goes down. And that's because we've now excluded people from some area that they used to harvest, right? Because whatever the non-MPA approaches were working. But then by adding in the MPA, I mean, I mean it might be healthier ecologically, but for the fisherman's perspective, there's going to be less places for them to fish. And so on average, the yield will tend to go down.